Hello, and welcome to the Atlantic Debrief, the Atlantic Council Europe Center's internet show and podcast on the most pressing issues impacting transatlantic relations today. My name is Rachel Rizzo, and I'm a non-resident senior fellow here at the Atlantic Council's Europe Center. And my guest today, I'm uh, so thrilled to welcome, is Tobias Gerke, who is a senior policy fellow in the European Council on Foreign Relations Berlin office. Uh, Tobias, welcome to the show, and thanks so much for taking time on this uh, beautiful August day to, to join us. Thanks for having me on, Rachel. Absolutely. Um, so today we're going to talk everything econ, uh, which is exciting because we haven't really had a show focused specifically on European economics quite yet. So back in June, uh, the European Commission announced the European Economic Security Strategy, which basically outlines the EU's plan to reduce economic risks in key supply chains and sectors. Uh, the term de-risking, of course, has garnered a lot of attention and stirred up quite a debate on both sides of the Atlantic. So let's hop right in and sort of discuss where we are with this. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the European economic security strategy and its key priorities? And then you know, while the strategy doesn't explicitly mention China by name, where does the EU and the U.S. both align and converge on approaches to uh, de-risking from China, if you will? Absolutely. So the strategy that was released by the Commission, I think the, the premise is pretty simple. The Commission, I think, says we want to stay open and open economy and we want to maximize these benefits, but we also need to minimize risks to our economy. And there are quite a few these days, and we have to be more thorough of addressing them. And that's really then de-risking. And so what the Commission says is we need to create this framework of how we assess these different risks. And it proposes four categories of risks. Um, it says we have supply chain resilience risks. It says we have critical infrastructure risks. We have technology security risks. And we have risks that come from foreign powers, weaponizing, trade links, and, and coercing us economically. And so it says we have to kind of really look into these different risk categories together with the member states and with the business, um, the business sector and really understand um, who is controlling choke points, um, where is our industry located in important uh, supply chains, what vulnerabilities do we have, but also what strengths do we have. And that's kind of the basic uh, premise. And based on that risk assessment, um, the commission says, based on this, we, we need to look for our policies. Do we have the, the right policy toolkit to, to mitigate these risks? Do we need new policies? And the commission already says a little bit, yeah, we might need some new policies, especially on technology security side. But it also says, let's look at the policies we already have. Um, do they need updating? Do they need to be streamlined? Um, what about our trade? instruments? What about our protections for the single market? Do, are they still up to the task of addressing these, these risks? So it's kind of the basic premise. It's a strategy. So it, it really tries to set out a framework rather than really go into concrete uh, details. Well, you mentioned the China dimension, of course. It is quite peculiar. I think you're right that China is not mentioned a single time in a document. Um, the document is country agnostic. It's one of the key principles that the, that the commission wants to um, keep. Um, but I would say, you know, a few months before this strategy was released, in fact, when it was sort of pitched by the commission, by commission president von der Leyen, she gave a speech at a think tank um, in, in Brussels. Um, and she, it was a China speech. And she gave a big sort of a state of the art speech on China, where basically she outlined a lot of these de-risking measures. And she pitched kind of that they will put all these measures into the strategy. And I think reading these things together is quite important because there is clearly a China dimension in the strategy. It's actually, I think, quite China specific uh, or China focused rather, um, but it's not explicit about it. Um, and then you ask where, so how, where's the US and the EU aligned on, on, this, on this agenda uh, and where do they might, might they converge? I think there's definitely the alignment on the broader idea that um, there are dependencies in various supply chains. We need to get really good at understanding them as governments, and we need to have we have quite a lot of urgency of addressing some of them. I think that's big alignment um, on the transatlantic front. 
But there's definitely some convergence. Um, already the, how specific we are about China. I just, I just mentioned that. But also, I think quite importantly is sort of what's the scope of national security in all of this. Um, I think for the United States, um, some of these economic elements, it's much more closely related to, to national security. I think for the U.S. government, maintaining a techno-industrial advantage, for example, is often framed as a sort of national security um, important prerogative. Whereas for the Europeans, many don't feel so comfortable of mixing up these two. One is sort of a trade thing. One is a national security thing. And it still takes some time. Or for many, it's uncomfortable to overlap these two. Um, there is convergence a little bit on this, but I think that's perhaps the biggest con uh, divergence on uh, between the minds across the Atlantic. I mean, it's interesting you say this because it seems as though, and I've said this a bunch in the past, that you know we are hyper polarized in the United States. But one of the things that I think brings together the Republican and Democratic parties is a newfound hawkishness toward China, not just in terms of security, but like a whole of uh, strategy approach where it comes to economics, uh, geopolitics, I mean, ev really everything under the sun. Um, do you see European states converging on this as well? Or do you think there's always going to be some really fundamental differences in how uh, European countries like define their economic interests and in turn define their relationships with China? Yeah, this is a question that can be answered in quite different ways. I think the bigger picture is definitely that it, there is convergence transatlantically on this. Um, there was a great report just recently by the European think tank network on China, for example, which sort of did analysis of China policy in, in 20 four European countries, I think. And they really show that, you know, the last three, four years in Europe, the China, national China debates have incredibly advanced. They have converged. Many countries have adopted China specific strategies. Many of them move more towards, a, um, towards the United States on this, I think. But at the same time, there's incredible differences between national strategies, um, especially on the economic front, I think. Um, where the sense that, that Europe remains much more economically uh, interdependent with China and much, much more um, dependent on the Chinese market remains strong. But I think, interestingly, I think there's, there's going to be some shifts, I think, in the, in the near future, because the, the, the past years, the debate was often about the difficulty of access to Chinese markets and that European companies need access to China, and that's not given and so how do we make China open up more? But I think that debate is changing quite rapidly because China's economy is changing rapidly. It's become a huge industrial power, uh, especially for example in, in the car industry where China is now the biggest exporter of cars uh, since this year and really eating into Europeans' yeah, industrial heartland, um, uh, a hugely politically important industry of course also in Europe. So this is gonna, I think, Really, it's shifting, you know, the, the thinking. It's much more about what kind of risks are coming out of China and are threatening us in Europe rather than this mindset of how can we make sure we have access to China and have a fair, fair level playing field in China. So the mindset is shifting a little bit. And I think that will also um, shift China, EU China policy, perhaps the most in the next years. Okay. Before, there's an article that you co-wrote that I want to talk to you about. But before we get to that, I wanted to ask specifically about Germany um, and the Zeitenwende that we have all been discussing relentlessly uh, since February of 2022. Um, it seems like a lot of the conversation is centered around, you know, Germany's need to step up to the plate, to invest more in the Bundeswehr. But there's also a conversation about really trying to avoid a similar situation that happened with Russia, where Germany found itself way too heavily reliant on Russian energy, had to quickly wean itself off. Um, a lot of questions uh, about what that was going to do to the German economy. It seemed like it weathered it pretty well. But now what's happened is that there's a conversation that has shifted toward China and 
about the need for Germany to ensure that it is not too dependent upon China as an export market. And there's uh, some push and pull between the German business industry and the government. How is that playing out? So I think what you described is really not controversial to say that everyone agrees, I think, uh, across the board that we need to get rid of de-risk. De-risking is, I think, everyone agrees on the term is something we should do. Also, business, I think, agrees. Um, where there's definitely no agreement, especially in Germany, is how do you actually do that? Um, who is in charge of de-risking over dependencies on China that we know about? And I, that's particularly playing out in Germany. I think... Um, you know, you saw some of that in, in recent weeks, also leading up to the economic security strategy, where um, the chancellor, the German chancellor came out and basically said, we agree with de-risking, but it really should be the companies who are in charge of de-risking. They know what they're doing. They are assessing their risk, and then they have to adjust their operations. Um, but there's others, including in the economic ministry in Germany, who see more of a state um, role in de-risking. Uh, more clear standards, what should govern, what should businesses do, potentially more clear regulation. Um, so more of a state direction in this. And so within Germany, you have this, this competition, I think, a little bit between the, the parties and the ministries, um, and between the business and, and, and government sector. And in a way, that's the same discussion across Europe. Um, there's quite some different approaches between, yeah countries in like the Netherlands or Spain and Germany and others, um, how they see de-risking playing out. What should be the role of governments to guide businesses what they should do and incentivize them strongly or, or regulate them and not. And so this is a um, debate. I think that's, that's, yeah, is still quite ongoing in, in Germany and um, we have to see, I think um, overall, what we're moving to is that the government will want a stronger role in, in guiding what businesses should do, how they should de-risk from China. But it's taking a while. It's going to be interesting to watch how that plays out. Uh, I think we'll all be watching that closely. Um, so coming to the article that you co-wrote, uh, which will also sort of broaden this conversation back to the EU a little bit. Uh, you mentioned one of the key challenges when it comes to Europe's economic security will be, and I'm going to quote here, striking the right balance between recouping the benefits of open trade with managing the security challenges of uncontrolled technology leakage to systemic rivals such as China. Uh, practically speaking, what can the EU do to strike that balance? And do you think that the EU currently has adequate tools to achieve these goals? Um, so basically, yeah, this goes back that um, the real the novelty of this economic security strategy, I think, um, is about this dimension on technology security. What do we need to do to make sure the advantages and the know-how we have in Europe uh, is not siphoned off and we kind of lose these advantages. That's, I think, quite a new debate. There is a very narrow security debate that has been, of course, around for a while, but now it's really been brought to the front. And the commission, when they drafted the strategy, I think for them, that was really the thing they wanted to talk about, uh, this element of technology, technology security and how do we protect it. Do we need to do more of the kind of export controls um, to control the yeah, technologies that we have? Do we need to be better on investment screening? Do we need to do outbound investment screening? And the commission basically on all of these says, yes, we need to do more um, because there's too much, there's not enough coordination between them. We wrote this article and we, we looked at this quite closely um, of kind of pressure around technology that coming out of Washington also uh, and from, from Beijing, where we think there's a huge competition over who controls and who has access to critical technologies. Um, and that's sort of at the center of, of, of much of US-China competition. A reality we think has really not been trickled down to Europe so much. That discussion is there, but it's quite in the background. And um, now it's kind of coming to the fore. And, and yeah, we think the way Europe thinks about technology advantages uh, te and technology security is unfortunately quite splintered up. Member states do 
their own thing, the way member states um, interpret uh, security threats is very individualistic. Um, and so we have made this plea that we need to do better to coordinate export controls. This came kind of out of the story that uh, in October, on October 7 in Washington, Washington adopted new export controls and semiconductor and semiconductor manufacturing equipment, which then led to a negotiation with the Netherlands for, for quite some months, um, where Washington was trying to convince The Hague to also adopt these, these regulations, as you know. Um, the Netherlands, you know, the Dutch went all around Europe and said, look, we are quite under pressure. We should do something together on this. They went to Berlin, they went to Paris, and they wanted to kind of make this a European thing. So we stand together and at least have a common response. And uh, they were kind of rebuffed. Um, no one wanted to be drawn into this. Um, and that kind of showed that Europe is also quite vulnerable to also from pressure from Washington as a small Netherlands. Um, and so now there's definitely more of an understanding also in Berlin that this case, uh, the, this negotiation with the Netherlands and the US was perhaps an eye opener that we in Europe need to do more on how we define what are critical technologies, not only how the Germans see it and how the French see it, but how we really see this together and that we share more information of the things we want to perhaps control, that we share more how we then control these things together, which is still very much fragmented. So there's a definitely understanding growing. Um, but it's one of these things uh, that's so difficult in Europe, where, of course, national security is this member state competence um, and trade policy is, of course, the competence in Brussels. And um, these two worlds are colliding every day now. Um, and that makes it really challenging for the European Union to act um, because of this difficulty with competencies. But this is really at the heart of the debate of the economic security strategy, I think. This is what the Commission wants to talk about to put member states together, to have these conversations um, and sort of to come to a common understanding uh, of what national security means in this new age, what economic security means, what technology security means. So it's more of a talking uh, and more of a, yeah, more of a political process than a legislative process. That's really what we need to look out for. How do they talk about things and will they really learn from each other um, how they see the world. Um, I think that's really the, the the core of it. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, that's, I think, one of the most interesting things that we've, especially on this side of the, of the Atlantic, have watched uh, in the EU over the last, especially year and a half, is just like how language has changed. The way that member states talk about certain issues has shifted. And in many ways, uh, a change of language can be the most important thing sometimes. It, it's at least where you need to start. Um, and then finally, kind of last question, you know, Spain is at the helm of the EU Council presidency. Uh, it has said that open strategic autonomy is one of its key priorities under the Council presidency. Um, what do you think we can expect over the next five months, especially in terms of, you know, boosting Europe's economic resilience and competitiveness? Yeah, so stay, Spain will go will have a really important role now to, to bring these conversations that I just spoke about to life. Um, they are, will be the ones who have to, you know, put this on the agenda uh, in Brussels. They need to put this on the agenda in the European Council. Um, and I hope they will do it. Um, but Spain is definitely working on this. So for them, they have this older or different concept of open strategic autonomy um, that they want to, uh, that they're working on. So the Spanish government, together with some other member states, they are currently working on a um, assessment of strategic dependencies uh, in four sectors. They have identified four priority sectors, which for them is uh, um, health, energy, digital technologies, and food. And so they said, well, we need to find a good methodology of how we analyze this together. Um, and they will come up with some ideas, which they, will, they, which they will present in October at a European Council meeting in uh, Granada. Um, so the Spanish were really focusing on this part, strategic dependencies, um, how do we diversify them, which is important, but you know, it's only one part of this economic security strategy, um, which is a bit wider. So we'll have to see how these two um, work together. Um, but uh, 
I think we are, we'll look out for this report that the Spanish will publish um, on how to do, how do we assess risks in supply chains? What kind of factors do we, do we need to look for? Well, that's perfect. Maybe we'll uh, come back to this conversation in a few months and we can we can have an update with you. Uh, Tobias, thank you so much for joining us today, especially during the August summer break. Uh, for folks that are on vacation, this will give them a way to stay connected to all the issues that are uh, happening both here in Washington and uh, in Brussels and Berlin. So thank you so much. And we look forward to continuing a conversation at some point down the line. Thanks so much, Rachel. Thanks.